Yeah, this is an interesting passage to finish up on. Paul is sort of giving some last instructions as he's wrapping it up. And as he comes to a close, he feels the need to uh, particularly set, uh, leave the Thessalonian Christians with this instruction, after this instruction from verses 19 to 22, which will be our focus, he ends with a, with a benediction. It will be the way we end our service. He ends by sending them off with a blessing and reminding them to read this letter to one another. But the main focus is this um, call to not quench the Spirit and not despise prophecies. And I don't know if it's the best title for this talk, but I've, I've titled it Authentic Christian Discernment. How to walk through this life with a uh, fiery, to borrow from the, the language here, a fiery spirituality, but a fiery spirituality that is not off the rails, that's not crazy, right? That's not un imbalanced. And I think uh, this is a little bit of what Paul wants to leave the Thessalonians with as he finishes this first letter. And he begins by describing the mark of Christian vitality, right? Christian spiritual vitality, by which I mean not spiritual in the sense of ethereal or sort of uh, uh, that of related to the um, immaterial world, but I mean uh, a vitality in our relationship with God, the Holy Spirit, God and his presence with the Christian. And it's interesting that Paul, in 1 Thessalonians 19, he, he really leaves them with this, it's a commandment, it's an imperative if you want to use English grammar language, right? It's this calling, it's this warning. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. Uh, and we usually, we don't use the word quench very much. We talk about perhaps quenching our thirst, and that's usually a positive. Uh, but this is, you know, the idea of putting out, putting out a, a fire or stifling a fire or, or turning something off. And uh, it's interesting because the Thessalonian church is a church that encourages Paul. He's encouraged by the life, the faith, of this early Christian community, most of the letter, as we've seen, if you've been tracking with us the last few weeks and months, is positive. It's, it's Paul commending them for their walk with the Lord. So it's interesting that he ends, nonetheless, with this warning, right? It's a, he's warning them about the danger of snuffing out, of stifling, of, of, of covering, of minimizing the influence and the power of the Spirit of God, the presence of God, the Holy Spirit in their lives, maybe individually as well as as a community, that this was, if he's warning them, it's certainly because he sees it as a possibility. He sees that it is a possibility that they might quench the Spirit, so he warns them not to. Now, I don't know how to explain how this same Paul and the rest of the New Testament and the rest of the Bible describes God and portrays God as this infinite, awesome God, right? He is an awesome, glorious, infinite, omniscient, omnipotent, right? All-powerful God. And yet God in his presence with us, his Holy Spirit with us, can be quenched. Somehow the way that the Lord has arranged reality in his Salvation in our life and his work in our life, he's arranged it in such a way that if we so decide and if we so move, and if that's a trajectory we go on, we can stifle, snuff out the influence of God by his spirit in our life, in the way we think, in the way that we feel, in the way that we act in our walk with him. It is possible. And I know that I've talked about this before, and we've seen this already in 1 Thessalonians, but what that tells us is the Christian life cannot be carried out on autopilot. Right? I think a lot of us have, you know, this theology rightly that um, if we put our faith in Jesus, Jesus takes care of us, and he walks with us, and he makes sure that we get from A to Z, right? From our uh, faith in Jesus all the way to heaven. He kind of he protects us and makes sure we get there. And in fact, Paul sort of speaks like this at the end of this letter in his benediction. It's what theologians have called the perseverance or the preservation of the saints. God preserves, protects, keeps his saints. He protects them from uh, allowing themselves to be uh, um, uh, 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 diverted from the faith 
uh, keeps them from keeps us from abandoning the faith and keeps us walking in in step with God all the way to the end of our life. This is a an idea that is present in the Bible without a doubt. But I think tragically sometimes we presume on this reality: God's going to take care of me. God's going to make sure I make it to the end. And so we switch off. We kick back. We we take it easy in our Christian walk. We we do not intentionally cultivate a re, a, 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 a continual persevering uh, time to read the scriptures, to pray, to worship personally, worship as a family, to, to spend time with the Lord, to pursue the Lord, to go deeper with God. And slowly but surely, the presence and influence and power of God in our life can diminish. And Paul seems to believe that the effect can be devastating, right? How many Christians are walking around in our city? How many Christians are sitting in pews and seats right now? And, you know, functionally, they may not explicitly think this way, but basically they're thinking, grew up in a Christian family, I got baptized, I went down the front during an altar call or I said a prayer to receive Jesus at such a point in life, and that's fine, it's all good. I can coast through my Christian life from now on. And Paul's warning is serious. He's saying, do not let this happen in your life. Watch out. And, and the implication is, you know, whenever the Bible warns us not to do something, it is by implication encouraging us to do the, the right thing. In other words, if the Bible says, you know, you, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not murder, you haven't fulfilled the law by merely refraining from taking someone else's life. The true fulfillment of that law is by serving towards the flourishing of others, promoting life in the lives of others and in your community, working towards a more biblically-based, flourishing, rich life. That's what not murdering is all about. We, we feel satisfied if I've not murdered anyone, I've fulfilled that law. But, but it's, to not murder is, by implication, meant to push us towards being a people that are life-giving. Or you should not commit adultery. Well, just not having slept with someone other than your spouse is not really the point, although that's the minimal. It's about being faithful to your spouse, being someone who uh, uh, blesses your spouse, works towards the, the enrichment and flourishing of your marital relationship. Okay? What I mean to say about that is when Paul says, do not quench the spirit, he's by implication saying, fan the spirit into flame in your life. He speaks like this elsewhere. He writes to his protege, uh, Timothy. And in the second letter to Timothy, chapter 1, verses 6 to 7, he says, I remind you, for this reason I remind you, to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, I do believe that's the Holy Spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Okay? Now, this is not this is not mean what a lot of people think it means, which which is I therefore have to go from church event to church event, from parachurch ministry event to parachurch ministry event, going after special ecstatic experiences one after another to sort of keep my 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 spiritual uh, flame being fanned. Right, I have to I have to go to great massive events where we stoke up and stir up our emotions, and therefore I can. That's not really. I think what Paul is saying, what Paul's saying is invest intentionally in your relationship with God. Invest. Any relationship in your life that, it, that you value, you invest in, right? Whether it's your spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend or parent or sibling or friend. If someone is truly a friend, someone that you love, you love spending time with, and you want to grow in there in your relationship with that person, you don't isolate yourself from them. Right? If you want to quench a, 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 a friendship, isolate yourself from them. Cut them off from your life. Stop speaking to them. Stop responding to their texts, their emails, or phone calls. But if you want to fan that relationship into flame, you answer those text messages. You call them up. You say, hey, let's go have a coffee. Hey, let's go, do, let's go fishing together. Let's, whatever it may be. You, you need to be intentional. You know, I think we all intuitively know, we have to be intentionally in investing time spending quality time with that person. What Paul is saying is, 
Then it's plain your walk with God. As I, as, I, as I wrap up, as I finish this letter, I want you to be a people characterized by a continual pursuit of God. Not, I said a Jesus prayer when I was six, I'm good. As long as I show up in church and give some money, I'm good. No, be a people who are passionately pursuing, growing deeper in your relationship with God. We know that um, James, in his letter to, to a church community, the, the Apostle James, he uh, Jesus' brother James, he, he, he's writing to Christians, and as I've said many times, he says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. He's not writing to people who don't know Jesus, telling them, hey, draw near to God and discover God. He's speaking to believers who already know God, who already have a relationship with God, and nonetheless he says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. If you want to have a growing experience of the real and living God in your life, which James says we can, I believe, in that passage, the key is draw near to God. And drawing near to God isn't drawing near spatially. Like if I go to a place, if I go to Cornerstone Presbyterian Church building, suddenly I'm nearer to God. But draw near in your relationship with God. We've talked about this many times in the past, right? We will often say, um, you know, if, you, if your friendship with someone is, is growing deep, deeper and deeper, you know, you often say, hey, uh, um, I'm going to pick on Logan. Logan and I, we're getting closer. Now, it's not necessarily about physical proximity, it's relational proximity and closeness. We're encouraged to draw closer to God, nearer to God. As Paul says continually throughout the letter, you're doing great. What you're doing, do, do more of it. What you're doing there that's so good, keep going. Go further and further in to what you're doing. And Paul is saying here, your relationship, relationship with God, don't switch on the autopilot. Go deeper, go deeper, go deeper, go deeper in that relationship. And so that's something I want us to be thinking about is, how are you doing in your relationship with God? Are you on autopilot? Are you just doing the going through the motions, doing what Christians do? Do you really believe that you can grow in your experience of your sense of the closeness of God, the presence of God in your life? Now, having said all that, Paul, when he writes his letter, when he says, do not quench the Spirit, he actually has something very specific in mind, a specific way in which the Spirit can be quenched in a Christian's life uh, that is concerning him. Let's go back. In verse 19 and 20, we read, Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Those are not totally separate commandments that have nothing to do with each other. They flow directly one from the other, right? He's saying, essentially, do not quench the Spirit, for example, by despising prophecy. The implication is, to despise prophecy is to quench the Spirit. And again, if we think of the opposite, well, what is one way to fan into flame the, pres the work and presence of the Holy Spirit in my life? To value, to appreciate prophecy. You see? So, Paul wants to speak about the reality of prophecy in the community there, and we're going to get into this. This is where I need you to work with me, okay? So I know that maybe I've lost some of you, but I need you to come back, come back. Because this is where I need you to work with me, because it will be worth it. The second thing here that we need to consider is, Paul wants us to think about our response to prophecy. He's saying, do not despise prophecy. So what is going on here? What, what do we do with this? What does he mean by prophecy? So if you have, if you hopefully, you know, as you picked up uh, your bulletin, you hopefully you've got a sermon outline, you can follow along with me. I want you to think with me, what is prophecy? Let's define it a little bit. Uh, to paraphrase one scholar, Easton, prophecy can be, biblically speaking, defined as a miracle of knowledge, a declaration or description or representation. I'm paraphrasing here, but that comes by direct work or revelation from God beyond the power of human sagacity to foresee, discern, or conjecture. In other words, God somehow communicates information to someone that they cannot acquire through investigation or through their own intelligence. They just, they just know it. Boop, it popped into their mind, right? And it's usually a prophecy when that is later communicated. 
So the idea of prophecy is really rooted in the Bible. The Bible, as we'll see in a minute, is essentially a prophetic book. We see prophecy in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, you would have these people who receive a message from God. They were sort of a lightning rod of information from God, revelation from God. And they would receive information from God and they would communicate it to people. And these people who would do this were called prophets. Okay? Uh, Eastman continues here and he helps. He says, a prophet was a spokesman for God. He spoke in God's name and by his authority. He is like the mouth by which God speaks to, to people, and hence what the prophet says is not of man, but of God, in the mind of the uh, Old Testament believers. Prophets were the immediate organs of God for the communication of his mind and will to men. Now, this is heavy-duty stuff. This is heavy-duty stuff. Some of these prophetic messages were recorded in, in written form and became our Old Testament, basically. Okay? Uh, messages from God to his people in the Old Testament, Israel. What's interesting is these messages were not merely about predicting the future. We think of prophecy as someone who has the supernatural power to speak of things to come. There is, there is some of that in the Bible. There is some prediction in the Bible. But usually prophecy in the Old Testament was God had called his people Israel to be a light in the world, to be a people who lived differently, a people who were blessed and would therefore also be a channel of God's blessing in the world, and they would get off task, they would get off mission, they would get lost, they would turn away from God, they would worship other gods, they would begin to act in ways that were unjust, and social evils would emerge, and things would, would turn into a mess. And when that would happen, God would send a prophet, basically as a policeman of sorts, or a spokesman, to say, hey, 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 you guys are you guys are off target, you guys are off the path, you guys are... are, are have abandoned your call, have abandoned your relationship with God, and you need to get back to it. That was really the main focus of the mission of the prophets is you need to get back on track. You guys have gone off track. And when they would do that, they would sometimes speak about what God was intending to do in the future. right? But they were basically trying to say, hey, you guys have missed the plot. And usually it was a call to repentance. They called a turn back to what God called them to do. Then we move into the New Testament. You guys still with me? We need to bring out trays of coffee, I think, for some reason. Prophecy in the New Testament. So in the New Testament, Jesus himself is described as a prophet, and he's revealed as sort of the supreme prophet. The supreme revelation of God to man comes through Jesus. And after Jesus starts or inaugurates the New Testament church, you see the first Christians come, you still see these figures called prophets coming around. And they seem to, to alert the church or help guide the church in different situations. So in Acts 11, there's a, a man called Agabus, and he prophesies that there's going to be a famine in the known world. A famine that's going to hit the region of Iraq. And so what happens as a result of this is churches get a bunch of food and resources and money together, and they send this to the churches that were most affected by the famine, and so they are able to respond to the practical needs of the church. So it's a very practical kind of thing. And additionally, in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 and Romans 12, we see that uh, we see a description of people having a gift of prophecy in the church. They're, ability, they're able to say things that are meant to encourage people. In 1 Corinthians 14, 3, we read of people who have a gift called the gift of prophecy. It says, these people speak to others for their upbuilding, encouragement, and consolation. <coughs> Okay, so in the New Testament, there are these guys who seem to sometimes get these predictions, and there are some people who seem to get these gifts where they are sort of empowered by God to say something that will encourage or upbuild someone else. That's kind of the New Testament description. All right, if you're following along with me, and trust me, most of the sermons that I preach are not like this, guys. Um, the question is, what do we do with that? That's... I kind of give you a very quick overview, and the question is, what do we do with that? And I do not have time to get into all the nuances of what we do with that. Okay, so I'm probably going to leave you with as much questions unanswered as answered, but let's just do a little bit of an introduction to this. What do we do with that? Especially since, as many have pointed out, at the time that we see all these people prophesying, we don't have a New Testament written yet. Right? You have all these Christian communities forming. They're hearing a lot of oral tradition from the apostles and the first followers of Jesus. But they only have the Old Testament. They don't have a fully written New Testament yet. 
And so uh, over the, the centuries, several people have said, we have a New Testament written and complete. We have all of the information we need to know about Jesus and how to trust him and follow him. Uh, the Bible's closed. The Bible is finished. There's nothing new to add to the Bible. So there is no more prophecy. This is, a, we get a description of what was happening during the time of the first Christians, but it happens no longer. There's nothing like this happening anymore. We're done. Okay? Uh, and most, uh, you know, most people in the Reform world or the Presbyterian world that we're a part of, in the West, I would say, that would be sort of the majority uh, report. That would be what most people hold. In contrast, we have other groups of Christians, namely a lot of people who are associated with the Pentecostal world or charismatic world, who say, a lot of them who say prophecy is going on full blast. I mean, there are people getting words from the Lord all the time, and you need to hear from the prophet, and you need to make a decision, you've got to go talk to a prophet, and on and on and on. Those are sort of the two uh, options that are given to us. So that's the question. Has all prophecy ceased? Is prophecy going on full tilt? Are we supposed to go and talk to prophets to figure out what we do with, with our lives? And here's my proposal. Hopefully I'll be able to land the plane. Um, I think that both those proposals are a little bit wrong, or very wrong. Um, and I think this is probably the best way to think about this. Uh, and this is a view that many pastors and theologians who wrote our Confession of Faith, the Westminster Confession of Faith, this is the view that a lot of them held, and it's the view that I find compelling biblically and theologically. Uh, what some would call, this is a theologian's word, it's not a word in the Bible, but what some would call immediate prophecy has ceased. In other words, there's nothing, there's no appendixes that we are meant to add to the back of the book of Revelation, right? There's no addendums. There's nothing to be added. It isn't a third or fourth or fifth testament. There's not a new New Testament to add to the New Testament. Okay? The Bible is God's revelation of how we can come to know and trust Him and live eternally with Him by trusting in His Son, Jesus Christ. Essentially. There's more to it than that, but that's the main message of the Bible. And there's nothing to add to that. That is finished. There's no one who can come to you and say, I have received the message from the Lord. You have to wear orange the rest of your life if you want to go into heaven. Okay? So if anyone has said that to you recently, you can rest assured that's not from God. Okay, um, But I think there's plenty of evidence in the scripture and in church history and in perhaps some of your own lives that something that we could call mediate prophecy continues. Right? And what do I mean by mediate prophecy? Is God has nothing to add to his doctrine or his revelation, but the Spirit is still at work helping his church, guiding his church, and orienting this church in particular circumstances. Mm -hmm. God is not revealing anything new about salvation in Jesus Christ. God is not revealing anything new in terms of his ethics, his morals, his commandments for his people. But he might be revealing circumstances, he might be revealing hearts in such a way so that we can apply God's revealed word more effectively to the hearts and circumstances of people's lives. So let me see if I can exemplify this for you, right? Because hopefully this can help figure out what this means. I'll give you an example from my own life. I know examples of other people's lives, but I, I don't feel as free to share those. So I don't mean to be self-referential. I just don't want to um, stick my foot in it and share something I'm not supposed to. Several years ago, I was um, meeting with a woman in my office uh, for counseling. Um, doors open. There was a secretary outside. It was all up and up. But... She needed counseling. This was at a previous church. And she came in and she had a million problems. I mean, she spent 40 minutes, 45 minutes, just fire hose problems in her, in her uh, relationship with her ex-husband, her children, um, her work, just tons and tons and tons of problems. And she just unloaded all these problems that were on her heart. And by the time she finished, I didn't know what to do. I had no idea what to do. What do where do we start when someone has, you know, tons of different problems in all sorts of different areas? So I really did not know what to do, and I said to her, um, can we take a moment just to pray? Um, just a moment, I'll, I'll pray in silence, and, and then maybe we'll see where we begin. She said, that's fine, I can wait, I'll close my eyes and 
So I closed my eyes and in silence prayed this very deep spiritual prayer. Oh God, oh God, help. <laughs> <laughs> and I just waited. And I wasn't trying to do anything, but an image popped into my head. A framed stamp collection. I don't know if anyone has ever seen a framed stamp collection. And the words, just the words, in my mind's eye, adultery. So after I sort of opened my eyes, I was not going to ask her about adultery. I said, hey, uh, oh, and I also didn't say, thus saith the Lord, I have a word for you. I said, hey, I know this sounds totally out of left field. Does stamp collecting mean anything to you? She says, actually, my, my, old, my, my, old, my oldest brother is an avid stamp collector. Oh, I thought, hmm, that's not very helpful. And she says, yeah, I don't talk to him anymore ever since he left his wife for another woman. <laughs> Adultery. So we began to look at that. And I had no new revelation for her. I had the gospel for her. We looked at, as we started talking, we realized she was holding bitterness against her brother. She had not forgiven her brother for not only that, but several other things that he had done throughout their life. And so when we walked through the gospel and how God's forgiveness toward us in Jesus Christ moves us to forgive others. And we ended a time her being led through a process of repenting for unforgiveness, forgiving her brother, releasing her brother, praying blessing on her brother, and she still had the other 999,000 problems, <laughs> Yeah, but we addressed an important one that I think the Holy Spirit wanted us to start with. I didn't add anything to the back of my Bible. The Spirit gave me new, no new doctrine. But the Spirit revealed something that was happening in her heart, which is the way Paul defines prophecy in 1 Corinthians 14. Now, let me talk to you about something. Haven't you ever had a situation like this? It may not be exactly like this exactly, but something like you're driving down the road and you suddenly think of Chris Wolf, and for some reason, not Chris Wolf specifically, I'm using another person as an example. You think someone that you, you haven't talked to in a long time, and you just, they pop into your mind, and you feel this burden to call them and to encourage them. And you do so, and they say, it's funny that you called. I just went through this, I'm going through this terrible situation. Has anyone had anything even remotely like that happen to them? You think it was because you're so smart? <laughs> it's information you couldn't have obtained through sagacity or intuition or... It's the leading, the guiding of the Spirit. And that person needed you to say something to them, which was likely just an encouragement that you could have found somewhere in the Bible as you were going through a difficult situation. I have a friend, not Rubio Details, who was going through a terrible problem that no one knew about. And a friend he hadn't seen in years calls him out of the blue and says, hey, I just felt the need to call you, check in on you, that you're not doing well and need to pray for you. And he said, just that simple act encouraged and strengthened him to keep moving forward through that difficult moment. God is alive. If you begin to pray, if you begin to ask God for help, he will be at work. And when he does that, don't despise him. Don't despise him. Paul, the Apostle John, in one of his letters, and really the New Testament overall, their response to these things is not, don't do it, or ignore it, it's test it. And that's what Paul says here. Notice what he says. He says, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Test everything. Any, anything, any experience, if you do have an ecstatic experience where you feel like it was with God, or a feeling, or something comes in, it comes to your mind, or you feel like you should say something, or if something, someone says something to you, you don't have to go, oh, it's God's word for me, I have to obey it because it might as well be in the New Testament. You go, okay, let me pray, think about it, and test whatever I receive, whatever it is. And... If it doesn't align with the truth of the Bible, because it's mediated, it's under the umbrella of the Bible, what does Paul say? Abstain from every form of evil. 
throw it away. It's nothing. Don't worry about it. So I want to give you an example. These are the sort of things that I've, I've seen happen. Imagine you've been wrestling for a while with the idea that, for example, you should abandon your current lifestyle and go on a foreign, go, go be a missionary on a foreign field somewhere, right? And this is going on in your mind and heart. And someone comes to you and tells you, thus saith the Lord, you are to eat, sell everything and go overseas as a missionary. You can feel free to ignore that because you should never let someone speak to you in a way that it presses on your conscience outside of the Bible. The Bible is your final arbiter that should speak to and direct your conscience. But someone might come up to you and say, hey, I don't know, I've just had a sense in my heart recently, you might have a calling to be a missionary. Well, that could be very likely the, the, the Spirit of God exposing the secrets of your heart to someone else so as to encourage you in your decision making process. Now that doesn't mean that if someone says that to you, you're going to sell everything and leave that moment. You should go through the right procedures. You should talk to your leaders, your elders, you should get theological education, you should go through the natural process. But it can be encouraging and helpful in making and taking the next steps in your decision making process to sometimes hear something like that from someone. It can be a confirming word among many that can help you. Later on, when you're in Zimbabwe somewhere and you're struggling to share the gospel and things are going wrong, you can remember, yeah, but people confirmed the calling. I felt a desire to do so. And, I, and Bob came up and told me this that one day. I think I have two or three witnesses that are confirming that God has called me to do this, even if everything is looking terrible. That's the sort of thing that we can think of. In the meantime, don't wait for a word to obey the Bible. So when I say all this, it doesn't mean that you're not you're supposed to be passive until you hear something from someone else. No, you do what the Bible's called you to do. If the Lord helps you with some guidance and some nudges along the way, that's great. But we have more than enough. We have a sufficient word to guide us in our day-to-day -day life. And that's really what I want you to think about. Abstain from every evil and hold fast to the good. And I'll end with this. How do we uh, really apply this last part of Paul's instructions to the Thessalonians? How, how, what do we do with this? I would say, pray to God first. Say, Lord, I need your help to draw nearer to you. To cultivate a relationship with you, I can't do it with my own strength. I'm fickle. Uh, I get distracted. I get tempted. I need your help. And pray that prayer every day of your life. Because you're always going to need his help. Second, do something about it. It is hard for you to read the Bible on your own. It's hard for you to get the discipline, try to develop it, or maybe commit with, to read the Bible with someone. Sometimes that can be helpful. Hey, you know, Joe, Tom, Lisa, whoever, can we meet and, and meet at a cafe, meet on Zoom, call each other, FaceTime, and read the Bible together throughout the week? Can we pray together throughout the week? Develop your relationship with, with God. If you get a sense that you need to talk to someone or call someone and you don't know how to explain it, do it. If it was just your gut, as long as what you were saying was encouraging and seeking to be helpful and biblical, do it with humility. Don't do it to build yourself up to make yourself a prophet. Just, hey, I just have a sense that you need to hear this or you might be encouraged by this, or you might be comforted by this. If you hear something like that said to you, say thank you very much. Test it. If it's not good, chuck it. If it's good, hold on to it and thank God that he's helping you and he's encouraging you and he's present in your life. If we were a community, and I think this is what Paul was, if we were a community where all of us were seeking to go deeper in our relationship with God and we were sensitive to those little nudges and we communicated them in a way that was humble and seeking to build one another up, that would be a community that would be on fire with the flame of the Spirit. That would be a community of vital, dynamic, vibrant, and powerful faith. And I think that's what Paul wanted for the Thessalonians I think it's what the Lord wants for us. Let's close in prayer.